We'd like to uh, invite our first guest, Sharmila Bacharya, is how you say your last yeah. name, I believe. Um, and we're going to, she's going to speak from the lectern up here. So welcome our guest, our first guest. All right. Well, firstly, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the movie La La Land, which, as you know, <laughs> features Griffith Observatory prominently, and I've actually never been here before. So, yeah, so thank you. And then I've known David uh, Reitzel here for 25 years. So um, it's a real pleasure for me to be back here with friends and family um, in this amazing venue. So today I'm going to talk to you about the, so how uh, these genetically small model organisms can actually tell us a lot about humans going into deep space. And so one of the things that I want to start with is what are some of the challenges that we anticipate that an astronaut who is going to Mars or is going to the moon, uh, what are some of the challenges that they're going to face? And one of them is definitely radiation. And radiation comes in a couple of flavors that we worry about in terms of biology. One of them is galactic cosmic radiation. And what that is, is actually consists of these highly ionizing, highly energetic charged particles like carbon, oxygen, uh, silicon, iron, etc., that can come at a biological system and cause a lot of damage in our cells. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. These particles are also very hard to shield against. Uh, so that's another consideration for when you're sending humans out there. You know, what kind of shielding will you need? How will you bring that about? And then the other kind of particles could be solar particle events. So for example, there, there are, they could be coronal mass ejections. Um, and these uh, result in protons uh, that are spewed out by the sun. And they could actually result in almost 100-fold or a thousand times more radiation than background levels. Now these are slightly easier to shield against compared to the galactic cosmic radiation, but the problem is that they're highly unpredictable. So, you know, an astronaut may want to go do a spacewalk, but then there's a coronal mass ejection, and that could cause a lot of damage to um, the biological system. So, so far, what do we know? What are the limits of what we have tested so far in terms of humans being in space? Before I actually go to that, let me just bring this aspect up, which is this little blue marble that you see here is us, the Earth. And as you know, we're protected by this magnetic shell that's around us, this magnetosphere that's something like 58,000 um, kilometers above us. And the good thing of that, this magnetic sphere, is that we are are protected from some of these charged particles from coming and hitting us when we're on the Earth's surface. But, um, and even when we're on the International Space Station, we're still within this belt. But when we want to go to Moon or when we want to go to Mars, then we're going beyond this area. And so the limit so far is we've done lunar missions, and, and you'll hear more about the Apollo mission uh, later today. Um, but these were relatively short missions. Now, we've done long duration missions, so astronauts have been on the International Space Station, uh, they've been on the Russian Space Station for a year, year and a half, but then those are again at lower Earth orbit with less of the radiation albedo. So then the question is for, for a biologist, to, for us to be ready to, to be uh, sending astronauts uh, into space, um, what are some of the things that we need to know and be prepared for? So this particular mission that I'm going to tell you about is called BioSentinel. And the way, uh, so what we're going to do for BioSentinel, this is a mission that's flying in 2020 that, that we're uh, preparing right now. It's going to be the first biological study beyond low Earth orbit since the Apollo years 50 years ago. And then it'll also be the very first CubeSat. So, so the other advantage of doing experiments in a small envelope is that they're lower mass, they're easier to send up there, and so CubeSats have become very popular. So this will be the first CubeSat that we're going to send up with a biological experiment on it. And um, the way it's going to work is that we're sending our payload package, which is pretty much this big, 
uh, as a secondary payload on the SLS, the Space Launch System. This is a heavy lift rocket, a little bit like the, the first uh, starting launch video that you guys saw. Um, so it's, it's uh, NASA's building this heavy lift capability to get us to Moon and Mars. And so our experiment is going to be a piggyback experiment. Um, and on the maiden voyage of the SLS rocket on the EM-1 mission, we're going to, to go up with them. And then when the rocket goes around the moon and comes back, our experiment will get flung out towards the sun and we're going to do our experiment for at least six months um, to a year and in six months we're going to be almost a third of the way to the sun we'll be at 40 million kilometers um, uh, and then of course e EM1 comes back but we stay out there and all of our science data comes back by telemetry so all of the data that you know that we will use uh, will be by analysis and I'll tell you exactly what our experiment will be about so for starters you may ask okay so what's the biological system that you're going to use to test the effect of this radiation this deep space radiation we're going to use yeast cells, and these are actually the yeast cells that you would use to brew beer or to make bread. Um, and of course, this is a highly magnified image. Usually, these cells are three to four microns in diameter. Um, but what's interesting is that their DNA, so their, the genetic material that's in their cell, is actually very similar to our cells and to our DNA, the way the chromosomes are arranged and so on. And so what happens is this deep space ionizing radiation that we were talking about causes double-stranded breaks in the DNA. And that's one of the reasons we were saying that these, uh, this radiation can be very damaging and we need to understand the biological effect of these uh, uh, particles. And also, the other factor here is that it isn't very easy to mimic this deep space radiation on Earth. We are doing a lot of studies on Earth at Brookhaven National Laboratory, where we're building up a database of what these yeast cells will do when we have a, a specific defined amount of radiation and a particle type. But in space, we'll have a mixture of particle types coming at us. Um, there'll be some amount of randomness and unpredictability as to what's hitting us. Um, and so that's why it's important side by side with the Earth-based data to get the, the data from missions such as these. And so in other words, to summarize, we're going to use yeast cells as biosensors to measure the effect of deep space radiation. Now, how are we going to do that? So it's, it's a, a simple idea, uh, and it has to be that way because, again, all our data is we're, we're not sending astronauts to do the experiments out there. This is going very, very deep uh, into space. And so we're using three LED uh, uh, lights, so three wavelengths of light. And what they're measuring in each case is one of them, the infrared LED, actually measures the growth of the cells. So it measures how quickly the cells are going to double. So that gives us an estimation of the health and growth capability of the cells. And the other two LEDs actually measure the, the color change of this dye, which goes from blue to pink to clear. And the way that happens is as the cells, just like our cells, as we use up sugars and other nutrients in our media, and, and we do the, the various jobs that our cells do, we also secrete stuff into the media. And those things change color in a predictable fashion. And so so by measuring these, uh, the color change and the, the change in these three wavelengths of light, essentially what we're doing is we're quantifying the um, effect that radiation is having on the cells in terms of growth and um, uh, viability and health. So you can imagine for, for a group of cells that have been hit by a lot of radiation, you might get a lot of death or the cells may be less healthy and that will impact how they're going to grow and metabolize. And that's what we will be measuring in a quantitative fashion. The cells are about room temperature? Very good question, yes. So normally these yeast cells, uh, we would grow them in the lab here at 30 C. Uh, but because in space these satellites are cold biased, we actually do have them at room temperature, which is fine too. They will grow there. They just grow slower than at 30, uh, but they function. 
So this is a, an exploded view of the satellite. Um, just to show you, it has, of course, it's an autonomous. Uh, it has to be. It generates its own power. It does all the telemetry. Uh, it orients. It, it can detect the sun. It orients in the correct direction and all of that. And so our biology that I was talking to about, the yeast cells actually are housed here, along with the nutrient media and things that we have now tested for up to two years to make sure that they will work when we send them into space. And alongside the biology, Biology, we also have a physical decimeter. So we have what is called an LET spectrometer that will measure the particle types the energies and how many of those particles are coming at us at a given time. So the interesting thing is then we can compare the readings from this dosimeter with the changes that we see in our biology and, and we can cross correlate with the data as we see you know, how the radiation is affecting the biology, we can compare it with the readings from this dosimeter. So with that, I'm now going to shift to, because I want to give you a little bit of a few vignettes of some different organisms that we can use to understand different facets of human health and physiology. So the fruit fly, or the Drosophila melanogaster as it's called, the, the, literally the fruit flies that will buzz around your rotting bananas, um, are actually an extremely useful tool for biologists. And if you compared the genes, the collection of genes that are in each of your cells in your body with those of a fruit fly, you would actually find that if you, if you picked out all the genes in the humans that you know are important for function, because if you get a mutation, you get a manifested human disease like Alzheimer's or diabetes, etc. If you take that subset of genes in the human compared with the yeast genome, you find a 75% match. And so um, with the fruit fly, which is this much smaller organism, it actually makes it very easy to do space flight experiments. Because in a box this big, I literally, I send up uh, maybe tens of flies and I get back thousands of flies. And so you can get an entire, uh, you know, group of individuals that were born entirely from the egg to the adult in space and you can look at what gravity, in this case uh, we were looking at the effects of gravity largely on the fruit fly. These experiments we were doing were on the International Space Station. And I'll show you some data in a second. And before I do that, let me just also mention that the other um, real big advantage of having a large sample size, when I say that I get back thousands of flies, why is that? Uh, so important. The reason is that, um, as I'll show you in a second, you know, when you have astronauts up there, you may have a crew of four or six people. Um, you have people who are young, middle-aged, some who are older. You have men, you have women, you have people from, uh, you know, you have astronauts going up from the U.S., you have cosmonauts, you have, uh, you know, European astronauts, you have uh, Brazilian, Chinese, you know, so there's such a diversity of the genetic makeup, even between siblings, you have so much of a difference in genome, you know, makeup or in the genes that you, you're made of, that it's very hard with humans, even when you extract blood and get data, it's often hard to come up with, um, you know, sort of a, um, a reliable readout of what the changes will be, because you might react one way and I may not, or vice versa. So with fruit flies, this collection that we get back are all genetically identical. And so in the next example I'm going to show you, the, that size actually does help us tremendously. So this example that I was going to show you is an experiment that we did a few years ago actually on the space shuttle, one of the last few uh, space shuttles that um, were, were going to fly. And we were using the fruit fly to understand innate immune system. So that the innate immune system is actually what your body, so our body also, kicks into gear the immune system when we're attacked by pathogens, whether it's bacteria, virus, fungus, you know, these things protect us from, from getting, you know, sick um, and, and it helps us feel better. So fruit flies have the same mechanism and one of the ways it works is if you look here in the green circles are blood cells and these little orange circles or dots that are inside are bacterial cells. So what happens when you get a bacterial infection is our blood gets into action uh, engulfs these bacterial cells, you know, uh, phagocytose they're called, 
and, and inactivates and kills them. And then you start to feel better. So look what happened with the flies when we had them develop entirely in space. What we find in the dark gray bar there is that there is a shift to the right, which means that the flies that developed entirely in space were somewhat compromised for this innate immune function. So what happened is the number of cells that were actively engulfing these bacterial particles was smaller at any given time compared to flies, their own sibling, that were identically housed in the same hardware and treated in every other way exactly the same, except that they were grown on the ground instead of in space. And you'll find that there was a shift. Now, this is where, again, the, and, and actually, and here what you see is that if you look at the number of bacteria that each of the blood cell can engulf, with time, there is a diminution of the number of bacterial cells that each of the blood cells can capture. So in other words, to summarize that, what you're seeing is space flight has resulted. The, so when the flies came back from space and we gave them an infection, what we found is that they were a little bit worse off at fighting the infection. It took them longer. They were slower at it than their siblings that hadn't gone to space. And here again is where the numbers come in. If you look at the statistics, because we have such large population sizes, even though the change may be small, but you know it's significant. And so when you think about if an astronaut is going to Mars and it's going to take him or her three years to get to Mars and come back, in that period of time, even if you see a decrement of, of their immune system by 10 or 20 percent, over that long period of time, you can imagine that can become a problem. And these are some of the reasons why we're interested. Yes, please. Do you find a rebound in future generations of the flies? Yes, yes, we do actually. And in fact, for this particular experiment, because we didn't have enough flies, we weren't able to wait very much longer. But we waited for another couple of weeks, and we found that they started to um, behave pretty much like the, the sibling flies. So yes. And we've also done that study with some other things that we looked at, like behavioral changes, and they did bounce back with time. Was, was the bouncing back after they had returned to ground? After they had okay. returned to ground, yeah. In fact, these changes we were also measuring after they returned to ground just because it's just easier to do it. But, you know, that's a, a good question you guys ask because if you did it in space, you might see an even bigger um, change. Because by the time you get our samples back, it's a couple of days after landing or maybe the fastest we'd get it back is, you know, a day after landing and so contribute the decline uh, because of stress or because of radiation? Now that's an excellent question and so in this particular case I'd have to say that I would guess that it's an overall stress so I would say that it's not probably not uh, radiation specific. The reason being that on the ISS the radiation levels are still somewhat lower I still think, though, in other assays, we do see radiation-related effects. But the way we're doing this assay, the, the chances are the more the effect is a gravity effect. But that's an excellent, you know, that's part of the thing is, you know, deconvolving those things. So one of the experiments that we just flew a few months ago that the, I'm going to talk to in a second, there we had a centrifuge on the ISS. So there you can control for gravity by having a 1G in space. And so we're actually going to get data from that in the next few months, and, and that will help answer questions such as what you just asked. All right, so here what I'm showing you is another example, and this is actually related to exactly as the gentleman asked, to, to an experiment that we just do, did a few months ago and that we're actually analyzing the data now. But I want to show you how useful the system can be and how much you can learn in the, in the future about it. So the cardiovascular system, so the circulation system, our hearts and how the blood circulates, this is an area where the fruit fly heart is not exactly identical to the human heart, but there are a lot of elements that are very similar, so much so that you actually can learn an incredible amount from this system. And so this is work of my collaborators that I'm showing you here, um, Bodmer and Oker, who are nearby in uh, La Jolla. Um, and what you see in red here is a schematic. If you look from the top at a Drosophila, in red here is the circulatory system. And uh, what I'm going to show you in a, in a second is how the heart beats in the fly. But before that, let me just tell you that if you looked at human population data, 
you would find that the older, if, the, in, if you looked at the entire population and you looked at the folks who are older, there's a higher probability that those people would have an arrhythmic heart. So your heart would probably beat uh, not at as regular uh, a rate as someone who's much younger, on an average. Now obviously there's always exceptions and genetics and so on, but on an average that's the case and that's the data that you're seeing here. Now I want you to look at this, photo, this video up here of the fruit fly heart beating. And there you go. So this is, the, it's a muscular tube-like organ. This part is the heart. And as it beats, the blood will flow through the organism. And now, and that's a one, what you just saw, which was a really regular heartbeat, was a one-week-old fly. So the equivalent of a 10-year-old child. Now watch what happens. Yeah, here you go. So now what, see that? Yes, and that's a seven week old fly, the equivalent of a 70 year old human. So in other words, what we're showing you here is that exactly like you see in the human population, you can sort of recreate that in the flies. This is the genetically identical organism, except much older, and you see that arrhythmia. So just like um, uh, folks on Earth are using the system to understand the uh, effects of aging on heart function, we're actually, with, in collaboration with this group, we're looking at the effect of space flight on heart function on animals that have developed entirely in space. So we just got the flies back. We got hundreds and thousands of, of flies back um, just a few months ago. And so stay tuned. Um, uh, you know, we're doing that work right now. And then um, I wanted to end by saying that, as you know, science is a team sport. Um, and so there's a lot of people that need to work together to make this all happen. So an acknowledgement to, the, to my team. And uh, with that, I think I'll end. <laughs> <laughs>